Tao Ohem the Ha Tao H. Jesus gave us the fundamental law of increase when he told us that unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Sounds simple, doesn't it, yet it is the basic law of all success, all riches, all power. It is the way the whole universe is run. You live by it, whether you like it or not, or you die by it. To many, this law seems unfair, but in this, as in all things, nature is logical, and when you understand exactly how the law works, you will agree that it is eminently just and right. You see, everything consists primarily of electricity of tiny protons and electrons revolving around each other. It is of these that your body is made, it is of these that all plant life is made, it is of these that all so-called inanimate life is made. Wherein, then, is the difference between all these forms of life? Largely in their rate of motion. Remember this, starting with the individual cell in your mother's womb, you attract to yourself only those elements that are identical in quality and character to yourself, and that are revolving at the same rate of speed. Your selective ability is such that you are able to pick such material as will preserve your quality and identity. This is true of your body, your circumstances, of your environment. Like it tracks like, If you are not satisfied with yourself as you are, if you want a healthier body, more attractive friends, greater riches, and success, you must start at the core within yourself I and the first essential to put yourself in harmony with the infinite good all about you is to relax, to take off the brakes. For what is worry or fear or discouragement but a break on your thinking and on the proper functioning of your organs, a slowing down of your entire rate of activity. Get rid of your tensions, says the modern psychologist by which he means think more about the agreeable things and less about the disagreeable ones. You know how martial music stirs your pulses and wakes even the most tired man into action. Why? Because it tends to increase the rate of motion in every cell in your body. You know how good news has often cured sick people, how sudden excitement has enabled paralyzed people to leap from their beds. Why? Because good news makes you happy, and speeds up your rate of motion, even as sudden excitement stirs up the whole organism. You know how fear, hatred, and discouragement slow you down. Why? Because those feelings put a definite clamp upon your rate of motion. Remember this, hatred, anger, fear, worry, discouragement all the negative emotions not only slow down your rate of motion, and thus bring on sickness and make you old before your time, but they definitely keep the good from you. Like it tracks like, and the good things you desire have a different rate of motion from these negative ones. Love, on the other hand, attracts and binds to you the things you love. As Drummond tells us to love abundantly is to live abundantly and to love forever is to live forever. And Emerson expresses the same idea love and you shall be loved. All love is mathematically just, as much as the two sides of an algebraic equation. Whatever thou lovest, man, that, too, become thou must, God, if thou lovest God, dust, if thou lovest dust. And that, again, is strictly logical, strictly in accord with nature's law that like attracts like. Whatever your rate of motion, the elements of like quality with that rate of emotion will be attracted to you. This brings us back to the law enunciated by Jesus unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him, that hath not shall be taken away that which he hath. Read the parable of the talents, which brought forth this pronouncement of Jesus, and you will see that it is not mere money or possessions that attracts more money it is the use to which these are put. You can't bury your talent and expect an increase. You must put it to good use. It is the rate of motion that attracts an increase, what the modern merchant would call the turnover. The oftener he turns over his stock of goods, the more money he makes on his invested capital. But if he fails to turn it over, if his goods lie dormant on his shelves, they will gather dust or mold and presently be worthless. The servant in the parable who had five talents put them to work and attracted five more, the servant with two talents did likewise and increased his by two more. But the servant with only one talent buried his in a field and let it lie idle. He got nothing, and the talent he had was taken away from him. We see the same thing happening every day. Statistics show that of all those who inherit money, only one in seventeen dies with money, of all those possessed of fortunes at the age of thirty-five, only 17% have them when they reach 65. The old adage used to be three generations from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, but the modern tempo has speeded this up until now most fortunes hardly last out a single generation. Why is this? Because of the old law of the rate of motion. The man who makes the money has set in motion some idea of service that has attracted riches to him. 
More often than not, it is the idea or the service that is important in his mind. The money is incidental and is attracted to him with other things of good because he has set in motion an idea that is bringing good to others. But when he dies, what happens? Too often the business is carried on solely with the thought of how much money can be made out of it. Or the business is sold, and the money put out at interest, with the sole idea of hanging on to the money in hand. Naturally, its rate of movement slows down. Naturally, it begins to disintegrate and its parts are gradually drawn away by the stronger forces around it, until of that fortune there is nothing left. You see exactly the same thing in nature. Take any seed of plant life, take an acorn, for instance. You put it on the ground, plant it. What happens? It first gives of all the elements it has within itself to put forth a shoot, which in turn shall draw from the sun and the air the elements that they have to give, and at the same time, it puts out roots to draw from the earth the moisture and other elements it needs for growth. Its top reaches upward to the sun and air, and its roots burrow deeply into the ground for moisture and nourishment. Always it is reaching out. Always it is creating a vacuum, using up all the materials it has on hand, drawing to itself from all about every element it needs for growth. Time passes. The oak tree stops growing. What happens? At that moment, its attractive power ceases. Can it then live on the elements it has drawn to itself and made a part of itself through all those years? No, indeed. The moment growth stops, disintegration starts. Its component elements begin to feel the pull of the growing plants around them. First, the moisture drains out of the tree. Then the leaves fall, the bark peels off finally the great trunk crashes down, to decay and form soil to nourish the growing plants around. Soon of that noble oak, nothing is left but the enriched soil and the well-nourished plants that have sprung from it. The fundamental law of the universe is that you must integrate or disintegrate. You must grow or feed others who are growing. There is no standing still. You are either attracting to yourself all the unused forces about you, or you are giving your own to help build some other man's success. To him, that hath shall be given. To him that is using his attractive powers, shall be given everything he needs for growth and fruition. From him, that hath not, shall be taken away even that which he hath. The penalty for not using your attractive powers is the loss of them. You are demagnetized. And like a dead magnet surrounded by live ones, you must be content to see everything you have drawn to yourself taken by them, until eventually even you are absorbed by their resistless force. That is the first and fundamental law of the universe. But how are you to become an attractor? How are you to make your start? In the same way that it has been done from the beginning of time. Go back to the first law of life. Go back to the beginning of things. You will find nature is logical in all that she does. If you want to understand how she works, study her in her simplest, most elementary forms. The principles establish their hold good throughout the universe. The methods they're used are used by all created things, from the simplest to the most complicated. How, for instance, did the earliest forms of cell life, either plant or animal, get their food? By absorbing it from the waters around them. How does every cell in your body, every cell in plant or tree or animal, get its food today? In exactly the same way by absorbing it from the lymph or water surrounding it. Nature's methods do not change. She is logical in everything. She may build more complicated organisms, she may go in for immense size or strange combinations, but she uses the same principles throughout all of life. Now, what is nature's principle of increase? From the beginning of time, it has been divide and grow. That principle, like every other fundamental law of nature, is the same in all of life. It has remained unchanged since the first single-celled organism floated on the surface of the primordial sea. It is the fundamental law of increase. Take the lowest form of cell life. How does it grow? It divides each part grows back to its original size then they in turn divide and grow again. Take the highest form of cell life man. The same principle works in him in exactly the same way in fact, it is the only principle of growth that nature knows. How does this apply to your circumstances, to the acquisition of riches, to the winning of success? Look up any miracle of increase in the Bible, and what do you find? First division then increase. When Russell Conwell was building the famous Baptist temple in Philadelphia, his congregation was poor and greatly in need of money. Through prayer and every other means known to him, Conwell was constantly trying to help his flock. One Sunday it occurred to him that the old Jewish custom had been when praying to God, to first make an offering of the finest lamb of the flock, 
or of some other much prized possession. Then, after freely giving to God, prayer was made for his good gifts. So instead of first praying, and then taking up the collection, as was the custom, Conwell suggested that the collection be taken first and that all who had special favors to ask of the Creator should give freely as a thank offering. A few weeks afterward, Conwell asked that those who had made offerings on this occasion should tell their experiences. The result sounded unbelievable. One woman who had an overdue mortgage on her home found it necessary to call in a plumber the following week to repair a leak. In tearing up the boards, he uncovered a hiding place where her late father had hidden all his money enough to pay the mortgage and leave plenty over. One man got a much-needed job. A servant some dresses she badly needed. A student the chance to study for his chosen vocation. While literally, dozens had their financial needs met. They had complied with the law. They had sown their seed freely and then they reaped the harvest. Except a kernel of wheat fall into the ground and die, said the master, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it beareth much fruit. You can't put strings on your seeds. You can't sow them and say I'll give you a chance to sprout and bring forth increase, but if you fail, I'll take you back and use you to make bread. You must give that seed freely, fully. It must be dead to you before you can hope to get back from it a harvest of increase. Many people will tell you I don't see why God does not send me riches, I have prayed for them, and promised that if I get them, I will use them to do good. God enters into no bargains with man. He gives you certain gifts to start, and upon the way you use these, depends on whether you get more. You've got to start with what you have. And the place to start is pointed out in a little poem by Nina Stiles, The land of opportunity is anywhere we chance to be, just any place where people live and need the help that we can give. The basis of all work, all business, all manufacturing, is service. Every idea of success must start with that. Every nucleus that is to gather to itself elements of good must have as its basic service to your fellow man. Carlyle defined wealth clearly when he said that the wealth of a man is the number of things he loves and blesses, which he is loved and blessed by. And that is the only kind of wealth that endures. Love and blessings speed up your rate of motion, keep your nucleus active, keep it drawing to you every element of good that you need for its complete and perfect expression. They are, in effect, a constant prayer the kind of prayer Coleridge had in mind when he wrote he prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best who loveth best all things both great and small, for the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. Remember that the only word often used in the Old Testament to signify prayer means when literally translated to sing a song of joy and praise. In other words, to speed up your rate of motion with joy and thanksgiving. And you have only to read the Old Testament to know how often the great characters of the Bible had recourse to this method. What do you want from life? Speed up your rate of motion and overtake it. Is it health you want? Then start by relaxing, by letting go of all your fears and worries. In a recent article, I read, Dr. Loring Swain, director of a famous clinic in Massachusetts, has under observation 270 cases of arthritis which were cured when they became free from worry, fear, and resentment. He has come to the conclusion after some years that no less than 60% of his cases are caused by moral conflict. In the Reader's Digest some months ago, it was stated that personal worry is one of the principal causes of physical ailments which send people to hospitals. It is literally possible to worry yourself sick, in fact, the chances are better than even that if you are ill, worry is causing the symptoms. That is not a modern discovery, by any means. In Proverbs, you will find the statement a merry heart cause of good healing, but a broken spirit drieth up the bones. And Plato observed 19 centuries ago if the head and the body are to be well, you must begin by curing the soul. So the first essential in curing yourself of any ailment would seem to be to let go of your resentments, worries, and fears. Make peace within yourself, within your thoughts. Laugh a little, sing a little. Dance a little, if you can. Exercise speeds up your rate of motion, but it should be joyous exercise. Do something you enjoy, something that speeds up your mind as well as your muscles. Dance, if you like dancing. Swim, ride horseback, play tennis do something exhilarating to the spirit as well as the body. Mere routine exercises that soon become a chore do little good and often are harmful. Unless you can get mental as well as physical exhilaration out of your exercise, don't bother with it at all. Do you want money? riches? Then use what you have, no matter how little it may be. Speed up your rate of turnover, as the merchant speeds the turnover of his stocks. Money is now your stock. Use it. 
pay it out joyfully for any good purpose, and as you pay it, bless it. Bless it in some such wise as this, I bless you, and be thou a blessing, may you enrich all who touch you. I thank God for you, but I thank him even more that there is unlimited supply where you came from. I bless that infinite supply. I thank God for it, and I expand my consciousness to take in as much of it as I can use. As I release this money in my hand, I know that I am opening the gates of infinite supply to flow through my channels and through all that is open to receive it. The spirit that multiplied the loaves and fishes for Jesus is making this money attract to itself everything it needs for growth and increase. All of God's channels are open and flowing freely for me. The best in myself for the world the best in the world for me. There is no quicker way of speeding up your rate of motion than by giving. Give of your time, of your money, of your services whatever you have to give. Give of that you want to see increased, for your gift is your seed, and everything increaseth after its kind. Solomon was the richest man of his day, and he gave us the key to his riches and success when he wrote, There is that scattereth, and increaseth yet more. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth, shall be watered himself, and one even wiser than Solomon told us, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Do you want power, ability, and greater skill in what you are doing? Then use what you have, to use it to the greatest extent of which you are capable. The Sunshine Bulletin had an excellent little piece along these lines, there is a task for today which can be done now better than at any other time. It is today's duty. And we are writing now a judgment upon our lives by our faithfulness or unfaithfulness at the present moment. This moment has its own priceless value, and if wasted, it can no more be recovered than jewels that are cast into the depths of the ocean. Each day has its share in the making of our tomorrow, and the future will be nobler or meaner by reason of what we now do or leave undone. What is ambition but the inner urge that speeds up your rate of motion and makes you work harder and longer and more purposefully to the end that you may accomplish something worthwhile? What is perseverance but the will to carry on in spite of all difficulties and discouragements? Given that ambition and that perseverance, there is nothing you cannot accomplish, nothing with a rate of motion so high that you cannot overtake it. It is in loving, not in being loved, the heart is blessed. It is in giving, not in seeking gifts, we find our quest. If thou art hungry, lacking heavenly bread, give hope and cheer. If thou art sad and wouldst be comforted, stay sorrow's tear. Whatever be thy longing or thy need, that do thou give? So shall thy soul be fed, and thou indeed shalt truly live. M. Ella Russell